Good morning. Welcome to Westover Baptist Church online worship service. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together. Know that while we may not be worshiping in the same space, God has his richest blessings for you as you view this service. We invite you to download the worship service bulletin on our homepage. Wherever you find yourself in life, we want this to be a worship experience you can depend on for receiving inspiration, encouragement, and support. Now, wherever you are, whether it's at the kitchen table or on the couch, get comfortable and enjoy the service. Please join us for our opening hymn, number four, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus the pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be Our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. A few announcements this morning. This COVID-19 pandemic has certainly changed each of our lives. One of the ways that it has made a significant change all around the world and here in Arlington is increasing the need for food assistance. With unemployment levels at generation highs, there are many, many more people in need of food. We have partnered for a number of years with the Arlington Food Assistance Center and typically do food drives one or, one or two times a year. We are asking that you consider when you're doing your grocery shopping that you pick up an extra few cans of food or some other non-perishable goods. We have placed a collection box inside the Levine entrance of the church, and that door is marked with a large number two and faces Patrick Henry Drive. 
to the left of the flagpole. The door is open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so we'd really appreciate it if you would drop by and drop those off. And once the box is uh, full, we'll call them and ask them to come and pick it up and start a new box. Uh, but this will be ongoing. And uh, we appreciate you considering that as you're doing your grocery shopping. Though we're not able to be on campus for worship and our other ministry activities, we do have ongoing expenses to maintain the building. We are grateful for those of you who have been able to continue to give uh, during this time. Uh, it has been very helpful. We are providing a number of ways that you can give. You can give online through our website. If you go to our website, there is a button marked Give on the right side. You can click that. You are asked for particular information about your gift. You can set it up as a one-time gift or as a recurring gift, and then fill in your banking or credit card information. You can give by texting. If you use your smart or mobile phone, you send a text message to the number 73256. And then in the body of the text message, you would put capital W, capital C, capital A, R, L, and the amount of your gift, and hit enter. And a screen will come up and then ask you again for your banking or credit card information to make that gift. You can also continue to mail your gifts to the church office. The mail is monitored daily and brought in so that uh, the gift is secure. You can drop it through the church office mail slot, which is the door between the flagpoles facing Patrick Henry Drive. And some of you can also take advantage of your online banking through your own bank and have them send us a check in the mail. Okay, maybe we need to go over this one more time. Do we have to? Well, sweetie, I don't know if you're getting a good grasp of the ratios here. Fine. Okay, all right, well, step by step. Before we spend any money, what's the first thing that we do? Give to God. Good, and why do we do that? Because he first loved and gave to us. Good, 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 good. Okay, great. Now the second jar here is for so many different things. Hold on. What? God lives in heaven, right? Yeah, he lives in heaven. And heaven has streets paved with gold, right? Streets paved with gold, sure, yes. So why does he need my money if I don't even have a job? <laughs> okay, all right, so good question. So basically when we give to God, we're, we're giving to the church. So the church gives the money to God? No, the church keeps the money. Oh, does God know about this? <laughs> yes, he uh, basically built the system, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. See, sweetie, as you grow up, there is nothing better than giving back to God. In the Bible, it's the only place God says, test me on this. When it comes to your money, he says, test me. It's almost like he's saying, I dare you. And your mom and I, we do just that. Even when things are tough... We always give the first part of our money back to God. And then the church takes that money and does all kinds of things to make God famous, uh, like camps and mission trips and even VBS that you love so much, and even helps out people that are in need. You can't outgive God. And when God says test him and you do it, he will come through every single time. Okay, Dad, I get it. I do have one question, though. Oh, okay. Why do we need to test God if he already knows all the answers? That's, that's good. Let me just retrace my steps here just for a minute. <sighs>
I don't care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You wanna borrow the new car? You wanna borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy, super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey, hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Mmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees. Good morning. Our scripture reading today comes from Luke, the 15th chapter, the 8th through the 10th verse. I will be reading from the New Living Translation. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. God bless his word and help us to be obedient. Our next hymn is number 210, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Jesus, I love thee, be I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art thou. If Singing the praises, the 
Hello, I'm Reverend Michael Youngblood, and welcome to our worship service today. We're glad to have you to be a part of Westover Baptist Church and our recognition and praise to our Lord and our Savior. Today's a very special day, isn't it? It's Father's Day. And to every man, I say Happy Father's Day. Whether you have children or not, you have the power to influence someone's life to make a difference, whether it be advice, whether it be support financially, physically, whatever it may be, you have the ability to make a difference. For those dads who are down in the trenches, hang in there. Time flies, and before you know it, that one that's in diapers now will be asking for the keys to the car, and soon after that, they're off to their careers and, and their life and their journey. So share every part of you that you can. What's most important is that you give them you, that you show them the experiences that you have had. Give them guidance for life. Show them the way to Jesus. Tell them what he means in your life. That's your duty. The Bible says train a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart. We may all wonder and drift a little bit, but how important it is to have that basic background, that basic training inside of an individual. When we come together, we pray corporately. We pray for one another. We pray intercessorily. And so I ask, if you have a prayer request, we have a very special place on our website to where your request will be confidentially secured and read and lifted to God where two or three are gathered together touching and agreeing and even if that's through the Spirit even if that is through just sharing our concern for one another Jesus said that he would be within the midst to answer our prayers and we ought to lift one another up in prayer these are praying times these are times that we need to pray. We've never seen things like we have right now. Look at the many things that are facing us on each side. As we share with God our concerns and our needs and our thanks, He then in turn speaks to us to let us know that He cares and that it will be all right. A, a read of the 90th song tells us that there may be danger on every side. Many all around us may succumb to that danger, but he'll keep us and he'll protect us. So let us come together now in our corporate prayer in the time that we pray together. Dear Father, I first say thank you. I thank you for every good and perfect gift that we know that has come down from above. Lord, we thank you for our life. We thank you for a reasonable portion of help for those things that you have provided for us, food, shelter, and clothing. Lord, we say thank you. And dear Lord, you know the desires of our heart. Some may be battling with health issues. Some may be concerned about financial affairs. And some, Lord, may have various arrays of the things that can go wrong in our life. But you are able to help us overcome any obstacles you have already told us in your word that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. You've already told us that you will never leave us, you will never abandon us, nor will you forsake us. But even as we go through the challenges of life, you're there with us. And we know that through it, we will come out more than conquerors. And so, Father, let us not be dismayed let us not be troubled. Let us not let anxiety get the best of us, but help us to put all of our concerns in your hands and then walk away from them, knowing that you will 
hear and answer our prayer. I pray for every family, Lord, that is bereaving the loss of a loved one, including my family. I pray, Lord, that you comfort us, you strengthen us, and let us know that that one that we loved, that person that we may miss, you have told us that we've given our life to you. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name and for his sake and our life and the meaning that he has. In Jesus' name, amen. Often, the title of my sermons asks a question of us. Where are we in our walk with God? How is life working for us? What do we know about God? But today, I want to pose the question a different way and a different question. Let's ask God, what do we mean to Him? And so the subject of my sermon today is what do I mean to you? God, what do I mean to you? Allow me to read the portion of scripture that our sermon comes from. It's Luke, the 15th chapter, the 8th through the 10th verse. Oh, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. What do I mean to you? God tells us what he means to us in the 66 books of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations. You will find, if you look, how much he cares for us. First of all, he made us and he created us in his image and in his likeness. Somebody say God doesn't make junk. And think about the complexities of our, our human or physical body, the capability of our minds, the strength of our eyesight at its peak, our, our five senses. All that we can do, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I often think about when I'm at the hospital or I'm looking at, at something related to, to medical uh, treatment, how many areas of specialty there are, how many things that can go right or wrong with this body. God made us very complex. He didn't make junk. And so with that, he has made us to be his best. We are the crown of his creation. And then he watches over us. He's mindful of us. He's not some God that's far away in the universe someplace that could care less or know about or, or know less about what's going on in our life. He knows everything that we face, every challenge that comes our way, everything that happens, our God knows. Then if, if I, I jump to the, the greatest display of his love, it's his son. A very simple Verse found in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God, what do I mean to you? God replies, I have given my only Son for your salvation, so that I can have a relationship with you. That's what he says. Jesus says, I'm your friend and you are mine if you will invite me into your life. And he says, greater love have no friend than a friend that would lay down his life for you. And Jesus is that friend. They didn't take his life, but he gave it. And so in this parable, we find God speaking to us to tell us what he means. Now this comes from Luke, and in this 15th chapter of Luke, it's very unique. Luke records more of the parables that Jesus shared than any other of the Gospels. What's a parable? 
A parable, some say, is a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. Or Jesus is telling something that has spiritual value of the kingdom of God, and he tells it in a way that the audience that's hearing it can relate to something else. But then also, through that relationship, understand the kingdom of heaven, or understand God. And so here now, he gives in this 15th chapter, three parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And all of them speak of what he's telling us about how important we are to him. The first parable says the man or the shepherd had 100 sheep and one strayed away. He left the 99 in safekeeping, but he went and he sought after that one sheep that was lost. I'm told sheep are famous for wandering away. I'm told that they're not a very intelligent animal, some people will say. And so they could wander away from safety into the arms of danger. But this shepherd, concerned about that sheep, sought him out. And when he found him, he brought him home and he rejoiced. That's how God feels about us. He will search for us. He will look for us. He's there. We don't have to go find him. If we seek God, if we just ask him to come in our life, he is right there. Then, following the parable of, of the lost coin, is the parable of the lost son. You may recognize that parable is often titled as the prodigal son. This young man, who really didn't have an appreciation for all that his father had done, and all that his father had provided, he bucked the system. In those days, it was the eldest son that should have received the lion's share of the father's inheritance. And then he would divide it with the younger siblings. He would, and this, would take, this process would take place after the father's death or at a point that he chose that he knew that he may not be able to carry out the duties as a father. But it was of his choosing. And so now here comes this young son, the youngest son. And he says, I can't wait for all of that. I want you to give me what I have coming to me now so that I can enjoy it and, and spend it and use it like I want. And Jesus says in the parable that the loving father gave this younger son that portion of his inheritance. And it says he went to a distant land and he foolishly spent everything that his father had provided for him. And when he was there, destitute at the bottom, if you will, he said, wait a minute, you know what? Here I am at a state, and if I look at and what's going on back home, the lowest servants in my father's house have it better than this. And so he said, I'll go back home and I'll repent. I'll tell my father that I apologize for the mistakes that I have made and the things that I've done contrary to his will. That's all God asks us to do. It's just repent. It's not some great feat, some great work that he wants us to accomplish, but recognize we have gone contrary to his will. And when that son came home, the parable says that the father saw him a far distance off and ran to him. In those days, the father didn't run to the son. No, no, no. It would have been the other way around. But to show the love and the concern, this father who was watching for his son, when he saw him, he ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. And he said, let's celebrate. My son is back home, and he's safe. They, they killed the, the fatted calf or the, 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 the best stock that they had to prepare for this banquet. He gave him new shoes. He gave him a new ring or a signet, which, which signified that he was part of the family. He had the authority of the father. And he, he rejoiced because his son was back home. That's the third of these three parables. It shows God's concern. But let me speak to you for a few moments about this parable of the lost coin. First of all, it says that it was a silver coin. Now recognize Jesus is speaking to peasants. He's speaking to people who are not financially well off. So a coin, to have it, a silver coin, 
was more than a day's wages. It was something very significant and something very valuable. You know, I, I look today, people will let pennies, maybe nickels and dimes, if they drop it, they won't bother to pick it up. It's not worth it to them. It's of no value. But Jesus is signifying in this parable, this silver coin had a great value to this woman. And so what did she do? She turned on the lights. I can imagine modern day uh, speaking. She raised the blinds and she got out the broom and she started sweeping. She moved things aside. You know, she, if, if it was around the bed, possibly, she probably took the sheets off. She did everything she could. She did everything she could to find that lost coin. God is saying, I am doing everything I can to restore my relationship with you. I'm looking for you. I'm, I'm searching for you. And, and, and you know what? Again, we don't have to search for God. If we would just open our heart and open our mind, He is there. All we have to do is ask Him to be a part of our life. The parable goes on to say, when this woman found that coin, she had nine, but when she found that tenth coin, she began to rejoice. She didn't just say, oh, oh, great, I got it. Put it in my pocket or put it wherever she had kept her coins. But she began to rejoice. There was joy. There was happiness. And not only did she just keep it for herself, but when you find something of great value, she shared it. She said to her neighbors, rejoice with me. I'm, be happy with me. What I could not find, what was lost, has been secured. It's back with me now. It's where it belongs. And that's what God wants for you, to be where you belong, which is in a relationship with Him. When we give Him our life, when we promise our loyalty, our love to Him, we will not be lost ever again. If we do it in genuineness and sincerity, it doesn't matter what happens. We just can't go and do anything. No, I'm not saying that. But if you love God, he recognizes that we're not perfect. David is called a man after God's own heart. He was not perfect. But when he made a mistake, he repented. He, he sincerely asked God to forgive him. And repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry. But repentance means that you don't go down that road anymore. You make a 180 degree turn. And so this lady now, this parable, she's rejoicing with her neighbors because what was unsecure, which was away from the owner, is now back in her possession. It's safe. And that's what God wants for you. That's what you mean to him. He will search. He'll do everything to make sure that you are secure in him. And in that 10th verse, he says, in God's presence, all of the angels are rejoicing of the salvation, the securing of that one sinner that has repented and come back to God. God isn't saying, I got to have a thousand people to be happy. But just you, if you, if you are not saved, if you have not made him the, the Lord of your life, he's saying, when you come back to me, not only am I happy, but even all the angels in heaven are happy. One portion of scripture says that there's rejoicing in the heaven over that one lost soul. So if you have not given your life to Christ, I ask, why not? God is expressing his love and his concern throughout the Bible, throughout your life, saying, come home, come back to me. I want you to have salvation. Salvation is to know or having your relationship with God restored, where it cannot be separated or broken again. That salvation means that when this earthly temple, when we die, when Christ comes back again, either before we die or after we die, if when he comes back again, we will be with him. Look at the 14th chapter of John. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. 
in my father's house are many rooms are many places for you I'm going to a way to prepare a place for you and when I come back again I will take you to be with me that's what our salvation means that we will never be separated from God and that we will never set foot in hell or have to spend eternity there salvation is very easy and a very simple process please pray this prayer of salvation with me as we give our life to God dear Lord forgive me of those things that I've done contrary to your will forgive me of my sins my transgressions dear Lord I repent and repenting means that I turn away from them and turn to you Jesus I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on Calvary's cross for my sins. And because you died and rose again, you paid the price, the penalty for my sins, meaning they are forgiven, past, present, and future. I believe that you rose the third day from the grave and that now you are there with the Father, and that one day you will come again. I give my life and my heart to you. I will do the best that I can to learn your ways, to learn what the Bible teaches me that you would have me to know, and to live a life that is dedicated to you. Thank you, dear Lord, for your forgiveness and for your salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My friends, if you have repented of your sins, if you have confessed with your mouth or if you've said with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you've invited him into your life, making him your Lord and Savior, saying that, Lord, I will follow your guidance and your will in my life, your way, not my way. I believe, Jesus, that you rose from the dead. Romans, the 10th chapter and the 9th verse, says if you have done these things, you have salvation. And salvation means that Jesus is a part of your life for now to eternity. There's nothing humanly that can be done to ever separate you from him, to break or sever that relationship. And that he is with you throughout the rest of your life. Challenges will come. Hard times will come. But it doesn't mean that he's not there. And it means when he comes back or either we take the last breath in these bodies that our spirit is with him. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And that when he does establish his kingdom, when, as he said that he would in John the 14th chapter, our home is not hell, but it is with him, and it's with him through eternity that we will be. If you've made this decision, won't you let us know? Won't you contact me, either through email or calling, or uh, just to let us know. Even there's a place on, on, on our website, you can let us know you've made a, a decision. I'd like to share material with you that will help you along your Christian journey. So until we come together again, I pray that God will richly bless you. I know that he will keep you. I know that he was always there. And I pray that through your studying of the Bible, through your prayer, that you come to know him in a very, very special way. No matter what's going on in our world, no matter what dangers are lurking, no matter what anybody else does, God does not change. And he's promised his peace, his love, and protection. All we have to do is to trust him. I hope that you will.